Hi, I'm Pastor Corey, and you're listening to the Orange United Methodist Sermon Podcast. We're a church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, that wants to help you find your place in God's story. And we hope this sermon can guide you along that path. Visit orangemethodist.org to find out more information about location, service times, upcoming events, and ways to give. We hope you enjoy. Good morning, Orange. My name is uh, Pastor Greg. I'm a retired United Methodist minister. Connie and I have been members here now for, uh, I think, about two years, been coming for about three years. Uh, We love our church family. And I'm so honored to be asked by Corey uh, to preach this Sunday while Adam is on his clergy leave. Uh, We have been praying for him, and uh, he assured me this week he's praying for me, and I need that because I'm kind of rusty. I haven't done this in over a year, so uh, please be kind, okay? Okay. it's really interesting. I was praying this week about the message and trying to get my spiritual fortitude built up and to be strong and courageous and all that stuff. And and as I was praying, um, I feel like the Holy Spirit brought to mind the image of the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. And you know how I, I think it's Dorothy that has to oil him so that he can speak and he can move. And um, I'm just grateful for the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit who comes and fills us and equips us and empowers us uh, in moments like these. So uh, come, Holy Spirit, come. Come be present in this place and in this time as we study the Word together. Our scripture lesson is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 16. It's a rather lengthy passage, but uh, and I have kind of jumped uh, about halfway toward the end uh, because it would take so long to read the entire chapter. But it's a, it's a wonderful narrative that tells us about God's faithfulness to provide for us. And as we continue this series on purpose, uh, we're going to spend some time this morning in the wilderness. We're going to be in the wilderness. And I have been to the literal wilderness of the Sinai where the children of Israel wandered for 40 years. And I want to just share some geographical context of this scripture with you this morning. I've got some pictures we're going to show on the screen, I think. Um, This is uh, me uh, at uh, Mount Sinai as the sun was rising one morning. Um, And as you can see, this is desolate terrain, and it's vast. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a few moments, but it is truly an amazing place, and particularly when you think about the account of the Exodus and the time in the wilderness uh, with the Lord that the Israelites spent as Moses led them. So listen now to God's word from Exodus 16, beginning with verse 1. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam, And Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt! where we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, When they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. 
Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. And then skipping down to verse 31. The house of Israel called it manna. It was like coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations in order that they may see the food with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the covenant for safekeeping. The Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to a habitable land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Cana. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's pray together. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and move in our hearts and minds that we might have understanding and insight and discernment into how these words of Holy Scripture apply to our lives. Help us, Lord, to uh, embrace the bread of life, the Lord Jesus himself, uh, to feast on him, to be nourished by him, and to be led by him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been trapped in a situation and have wondered, how in the world did I get here? Have you ever felt like you were going nowhere fast? Have you ever felt lost or bewildered? One thing you probably don't know about Connie and me is that we spent two years ministering in Cambodia, which at the time was one of the, the poorest nations in the world. Connie had a prayer ministry uh, to expat women who were primarily missionaries. I was pastoring at a large international church and preparing young Cambodian pastors uh, for their ministry in these small fledgling churches out in the rural areas of Cambodia at the Methodist Bible School. My first assignment in my new church was to attend a workshop on peace building in Phnom Penh, a city of one million. The lead pastor gave me the address of my destination, but really no directions on how to get there. Now keep in mind, I'm brand new to the town. All I had was a simple map, the kind that tourists pick up like in the lobby of a hotel. This was long before GPS and smartphones. I hailed a motorcycle taxi, which seemed to be waiting on every street, especially where foreigners lived, with my helmet in hand and uh, my backpack on my shoulder. And I climbed on board, and after about 20 minutes, I motioned to the driver to make a right turn onto Street 608. However, when I began to look for House 73, I was immediately confused because the numbers on the outside walls of these houses were not sequential. Number 45 was next door to number 25. And number 39 was next door to 69. 
And on and on it went. It was insanity. When we reached the end of this dirt street, having not found my destination, um, the driver, sensing my frustration and my anxiety, took matters into his own hands, and he just decided to go exploring. And he turned on another street and another street. And I tried to get him to understand, but he, he spoke no English. So I grabbed his arm and motioned for him to stop. And I looked at my map again, tried to make sense of it, increasingly anxious that maybe this guy was going to rob me and throw me in a ditch or something. I had no idea. He smiled at me, which was reassuring. But then I thought, he's probably thinking, stupid American, which really was not that far from the truth. We resumed our search with no success, and after 15 minutes, I saw a convenience store, and I motioned to him to let me off. And I paid him, and I went inside and asked the clerk if she could help me. She spoke no English, so a dead end. I bought a soft drink, a Pepsi, and I sat down, and I began to think about my situation. I was lost as a foreigner and a stranger wandering in the wilderness of this great city. And I prayed, God, you know where I am, even if I don't. Show me what to do and where to go. And no sooner than I finished that prayer, a Chinese man walked in to pay for his gas. And uh, I asked him if he spoke English. He spoke a little English, he said. And I showed him my map and I said, I'm lost. I need to find this address. And I handed it to him and he looked at it. And then he showed me exactly where I needed to go because he worked in that same area. And within minutes, I was on another taxi, motorcycle taxi, and I found my way to my meeting. Now, this was not the last time that I would get lost in Phnom Penh, both literally and figuratively. Uh, there were times when I struggled to understand what my purpose was in being there. We had moved 10,000 miles to the other side of the world for me to serve as an assistant pastor in this exciting interdenominational, um, international church that ministered primarily to expats, but also to uh, native Cambodians who spoke some English. But the job description that was given to me when I was hired uh, did not really match up to the day-to-day -day responsibilities. I often felt more like a secretary for the lead pastor and a gopher that ran errands for him. And I often wondered, God, why have you brought me here? It felt like a bait and switch situation. There are times in life when all of us go through wilderness wanderings. Amen? It may be a dream job that turned out to be a nightmare, uh, a loss of employment, or simply underemployment, an ongoing conflict with someone that just can't seem to get reconciled, an unrelenting depression that won't lift, an unhappy marriage, a crisis in your family, infertility, a miscarriage, a problem child, unexpected illness, the death of a spouse or divorce. All of these things can feel very much like a desert. When my mother died six years ago, my dad was overwhelmed with sorrow. I tried to reassure him. I'd been through this experience with lots of parishioners over the years as, as a pastor, but I tried to reassure him that what he was going through was normal for someone who had been married to the same person for 60 years. I don't think I was much help. My dad felt lost and alone in a wilderness of grief. Our scripture lesson this morning is one of the many examples in the Bible where God's purposes involve time in the wilderness. Listen to this brief survey of only a few passages. In Genesis 16, Hagar, pregnant with Ishmael, languishing in the wilderness after fleeing Abraham and, and her mistress, her angry mistress, Sarah. In Exodus 3, we see Moses spending 40 years in the wilderness tending his father-in-law sheep. Deep in the wilderness, the Bible says, before God's purposes were finally revealed to him in a burning bush.
bush encounter with Yahweh. Elijah fled into the wilderness. You know the story. Uh, having defeated the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, he now found himself in the very same desert where the Israelites will wander for 40 years. And there alone and depressed, he cried out to God. He prayed, enough of this God, take my life. In the Gospels, nearly all of John the Baptist's ministry took place, literally, in the solitude of Judea's wilderness. He was preparing the way for the Messiah through a ministry of, of isolation and solitude, again, in the wilderness of Judea. And then in Matthew 4, that same wilderness, Jesus is purposefully led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days of extreme temptation by the devil. Now, having lived on this planet for nearly seven decades, which kind of blows my mind, I, I, I can't some days accept that I'm getting that old. I am convinced now more than ever that God on purpose allows us, even sometimes may lead us to wander in the wilderness. When I use Google or Apple Maps to plot a course to my destination, I usually pick the quickest and the most direct route, don't you? Sure, and it's very helpful. They give you three or four options sometimes. Why then does God intentionally lead Israel into the desert on a journey that was much long, longer and harder than it had to be? The direct route, the trade route from Egypt uh, through the Middle East towards uh, the land of Cana was hundreds of miles shorter Several years ago, Connie and I were riding on a tour bus for two days on our way to Cairo. Uh, we were traveling through the wilderness of Sinai, this same country where our scripture takes place. We had a very tough-looking uh, Egyptian security guy on our bus with a very big handgun. And then leading us through the desert was a Toyota pickup full of heavily armed soldiers because at that time the rumor was Al-Qaeda had a camp in the wilderness of Sinai. There were no trees, there were no rivers, there was very little vegetation or wildlife. It was one of the most desolated places I have ever seen. Just miles and miles of sandy terrain and massive granite mountain peaks. The word wilderness in, in our mind as Americans usually is like National Park Wilderness, right? A virgin forest wilderness. But in the Bible, in the language of the Bible, in the experience, the geography of the Bible, nature, uh, this, this wilderness, is desert, which is referred to in the scriptures with the language of desolation and danger and chaos. And this, this, keep this in mind, this is where a God of love a God of deliverance and salvation purposefully took Israel after delivering them from slavery, which on the surface seems to me to be unnecessarily cruel. Only one month after their miraculous liberation, the Israelites found them in the middle of God's story, a story of deliverance, but their freedom would come with suffering, with struggle and plenty of uncertainty. And guess what? The people were not happy about this. They grumbled incessantly. What are we doing here, Moses? This exodus is a waste of time. We had more to eat back in Goshen. Why have we been delivered from slavery to face certain death, starvation, why, Moses, can you explain this to us? Where, where is this land of milk and honey that the God of our forefathers has promised us? Waiting, wandering, wandering in the wilderness is so hard, is it not? You know, I remember the sermon that Corey preached back in Advent 
on this very topic. When I started preparing for this, this sermon, um, I thought about all the times when I've asked God, when will you intervene in, in my situation? When will you answer my prayers? When will you remove this burden from my stooped shoulders? Maybe you felt the same way. I mindfully, mindfully, when I started this series, uh, set aside a day to take note of every time I complained about something, either mentally or with my mouth. And uh, I was quite embarrassed by it because I soon realized that I'm a very skilled complainer. I complained about the North Carolina heat and humidity, which seemed to have come much too early this year. I complained about the guy on my bumper in traffic on 15501. I complained about having another migraine or indigestion that woke me up during the night. I complained about not being able to sleep through the night. I complained about the state of our nation and its politics, about Biden and Trump. I complained about the lack of rain and the nibbling rabbits who were eating my flowers, my expensive flowers. And I was complaining about these these foreign bugs, these Japanese beetles that were destroying my black cherry tree in the front yard. Friends, I have searched the scriptures. I am pretty sure there is no spiritual gift of grumbling. Lord have mercy on us, on us that complain. Exodus 16, 2-3 tells us that the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, but now you have brought us into the wilderness to starve us all to death. This grumbling became a way of life for them. In ten different passages from Exodus to Numbers, the the people grumble. Numbers 11 tells us that their unrelenting complaints were heard by God and he became angry with them. Moses also despaired. This found in Numbers. He says, I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor and spare me this misery. Dude, that is one discouraged leader. However, here in Exodus 16, here in Exodus 16, The complaining is received by God as a prayer. This was a revelation for me this week. As a prayer. Because God does not respond with judgment on this occasion, with discipline, with punishment. God responds graciously and generously by sending quail in the evening and manna in the morning to feed his children. Just think on that for a few moments. What's going on here? Well, I think God is trying to teach his people to place their trust in him, not in their former Egyptian taskmasters who fed them slave rations back in Goshen. God says, now it's time to fully rely on me. You are no longer slaves. I have set you free and I will provide for you. Again, let me say that after wandering in my own share of wilderness experiences, I am convinced that God will take care of us in unexpected ways. The Chinese guy that walked into the convenience store was a part of God's provision at a desperate moment for me. Um, Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread, he says, which means every day of our lives, We should rely on our Heavenly Father to provide what we need regardless of our circumstances. And for Israel, the bread, the manna, fail every morning to feed God's people except on the Sabbath. And they didn't know what to make of these flaky, you know, food pieces that were lying on the ground in the morning like dew or frost. Um, I think this was the original wonder bread. But it didn't come wrapped in a plastic bag and a twist tie. No one had ever seen anything like it. And the people called it what? Manna. 
manna. Do you know what manna li literally means in Hebrew? What is it? That's kind of funny, isn't it? It's man, huh? I mean, what is manna? What was it? It was mysterious and it was miraculous. One of the things that I really cherish about our Methodist understanding of the Lord's Supper is that communion involves a mystery. The ordinary becomes the extraordinary. The natural becomes supernatural. As we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we call this a means of grace. The love and sacrifice of Jesus is always, always greater than our ability to fully understand it. It seems foolish to outsiders that we observe this thing, this Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. But to us, it is God's salvation. Sometimes the best we can do, the only thing we can do is to worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we marvel at the mystery and the goodness of God's provision. Recently, I walked through... Um, a wilderness in a totally unexpected way. Our son John and his family had come to visit us from Kentucky, and that was a, a stressful several days. I was dealing with some challenges during their visit. I felt stressed and depressed and anxious about a lot of things. And at one point, I lashed out at John and talked very harshly to him, so so much so that John told me later that he had, he could not remember a time in his life in, in over 40 years of living where, I, where I'd ever talked to him in that way. And I was so embarrassed and humiliated by it. Um, we, we reconciled, of course, but I knew something was askew in my soul. So I asked Pastor Adam and Pastor Corey to pray for me, and I also requested a counseling referral from Corey, and I began meeting with a the therapist and discovered fairly quickly that I was deeply grieving over the loss of my ministry, of my vocation in retirement. I dealt with many challenges. Connie and I both did in our move to North Carolina from Kentucky, a new state, a new place, during a pandemic. I was unaware how deeply stuck I was in my grief. In other words, I was wandering in a wilderness of loss and change. The therapist gently reminded me along about the third or fourth session that I am not what I do. I am not what I do. My identity is formed by God in Christ. I am a child of God first and foremost, even though I'm no longer a pastor of a church. My relationship to God will never change no matter what happens in my circumstances. And she challenged me to think about the things that I value in life, the things that I inescapably care about, and to use those as a guide for my remaining years here on earth. And I began to pray about that, asking God about my purpose in this new season, this final season, the winter of my life in retirement. And then one morning during my devotional time, I was just flooded with insight and inspiration. And as fast as I could write down, I had 15 values on uh, my computer. And um, it was amazing how it helped me to refocus and to understand fresh and anew who I am and what I aspire to be in my life now as a retired pastor. There were things like loving God and sacrificially and generously loving my wife and loving my neighbors as much as I love myself, being positive and grateful every day, investing time and resources in my grandsons, remembering that I'm a child of God, that I'm not an accident. I'm not unwanted. I'm not stupid. I am loved unconditionally by God. It, it was a reminder to me that forgiving others that have hurt me is so important and growing in self-awareness and embracing truth, reading, studying, uh, appreciating and caring for the natural world 
And on and on it went. My church supporting it with my prayers, my, my presence, my gifts, my service, and my witness. Praying daily for my pastors, loving them, encouraging them, being on their side, on their team. It was frustrating to me that it took me so long to make sense of all this. Uh, three and a half years, in fact. But at least it wasn't 40, right? <laughs> Finding and knowing your purpose is not an easy journey. It's just not. It takes time and patience and exploration. As for Jesus, we all know that his purpose in life involved uh, suffering and sacrifice. But even Jesus had some things to learn. Listen to what Hebrews 5, 9 says. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Jesus, the son of God, God incarnate, learned to obey through the things he suffered. And so as a response to this morning's message, I want you to bow your heads with me. And, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to speak to you in this moment. Just open your spirit, your mind, to hear the Spirit speak. How am I responding to the uncertainty of trying times? This is such an important question for our day, individually and for us as a nation and as a community of faith, as a church. How am I responding to the uncertainty of trying times? What am I learning while waiting, wandering, and wondering? What am I learning? Lord, help me, help us to remember that time wandering in the wilderness of life, when those times come, is, is not time that's ever wasted if you are our guide. In Jesus' name, amen. Now there's a prayer that at critical moments in my spiritual journey over the last, what, 30 years has meant a great deal to me. And it's a prayer by Thomas Burton who uh, was a monk that lived at an abbey uh, at the Gethsemane Monastery, not far from where we lived in Kentucky during our time there. And I've been, on, I've been to Gethsemane many times for retreats, day retreats and overnight retreats. In my first retreat there, I found this prayer in the chapel. And I've come back to it during times of uncertainty and have prayed it with Merton and all the saints to our God. So would you join me in these words? My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the decision to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have the desire in all that I am doing I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may not know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's sermon. Please join us again next week. In the meantime, you can find us online at orangemethodist.org.